leader to be successful. All right, now that you're a free man, you've had 46 days, and by the way, one of the first things that you did surprised me. We were talking backstage. One of the first things you did was you took a lesson. Yeah, I've been a call. I've been a call for for 30 years, but I never had a chance to take a lesson. Right. I'm I'm one of the few guys on earth that's been in 120 countries and never seen anything. <laughs> Other than, other than a customer's office or a hotel room. So I think really simple, stupid things are exciting when you finally are, are, uh, get a chance to pick your own time. Now, do you wish now that you'd done more of the let's go, giddy up, than the sort of traditional uh, corporate approach? You, you know, look, I, I always felt lucky because to a certain extent, um, the company I led had a chance to sit in the front seat of history. Okay, so, so GE today, let's say, has 10 or $15 billion revenue in China. But I went to China when our revenue was nothing, zero. So I, I've had a chance to see how do you build a multinational organization in what I would argue would be either the, the biggest or the second biggest market on earth and do it from a ground level. You, you know, Mike, so I think you can do that at a company like GE that's harder to do in a small company, right? I'd say the extent to which we can bend the curve in healthcare, you know, big companies can figure some of those things out, and that's the, that's the purpose we solve. Now, in the six or so weeks uh, since you left as chairman of GE, the narrative about GE has changed massively. Uh, it was from a company that had some headwinds to a company with a cash flow problem, massively lowering guidance and cutting its dividend, sending the stock reeling. What happened? Look, I think, Mike, the, uh, the fact of the matter is this is hard to outrun in-use markets. Hard to outrun? Outrun in-use markets. The company's in two really tough in-use markets in the power sector and the oil and gas sector. And at the end of the day, we're a composite of the, of, the, of the businesses we're in. I own a ton of stock. I believe in the company for the long term. Uh, this is a great team, and I'm fully confident that this, this company is going to thrive in the future. It's 125 years old. We go through cycles. And I'm extremely confident in the team. And if you look at what's happened and what's been said in the six weeks since you left, do you feel like you should have had more of a grasp of what was happening? Do you feel like you had a blind spot? Look, I, I think, Mike, I ran the company for 16 years. You know, that's kind of 65 financial quarters. I worked at 100 hours a week. I, I, we had a pretty good knowledge of the company. Oil and gas sector is tough. Power sector is tough. Again, this is a really great company. I'm very confident in the future for GE. A couple of weeks after you left, the Wall Street Journal reported that for much of your run, an empty business jet followed your GE-owned plane on trips around the world in case yours had mechanical problems. Now, you said you didn't approve that. How did it happen? Look, I think it, it's a practice that, in retrospect, I wish we hadn't done. Uh, it was never ever, something, it was never something I approved. I never really talked it? to the guy on our, in corporate air, really. So... In every way, I think I was this just about the work. I really was. It was a terrible practice. As soon as I found out about it, we stopped it. And so you didn't notice the extra plane? I really never thought about it, looked for it, knew what it was. I was totally focused on the job. I'm a 100-hour-a-week guy. Now, here's uh, something that will serve the students here at Chapel Hill at the University of North Carolina. What can we learn as leaders, as would-be rising leaders from that episode? Well, look, I think you always uh, have to be aware of what's going on around you, but you also have to, you know, when a company of 330,000 people, you need to be able to rely on the people around you to kind of have great business practices and get them done. And, and the second we found out about it, we changed it. But again, you're never uh, perfect when you run a company that size. I'd say that beyond that, Mike, what I would tell everybody in here is, the importance of resilience. You know, in other words, we're sitting here today in the course of a 35-year-old career, you're bringing up some tough days. But nobody's going to have a perfect path. I sure haven't. But I was always willing to wake up the next day in charge, focused, desiring to do a good job for the company. I always put the company first in everything I did. So I think for the students in here, the best thing they can learn is the importance of resiliency, perseverance. You mentioned your amazing 35-year run at GE starting in 1982. Pretty unlikely that any of our friends here will be in one place 35 years. Look, I think the nature of work, the future of work, is going to change massively. You know, I think uh, uh, 
just the nature of small business and the role that small business plays. But there's still going to be a need for companies like GE in that world. Um, when you leave here, you're going to fly back to New York, I assume. You're going to look out at 35,000 feet, and you're going to see a jet engine on the wing. It's the only thing keeping you alive at that moment in time. 75% of the time, that's going to be a GE engine. You need that engine built by people that know what they're doing, that maybe have been with the company for 20 or 25 years. So there's always going to be a need for products like that. Now, uh, during your days as a free man, you were, we we're talking about how everything's happening faster. Now, you were the front runner to be the CEO of Uber, and then you weren't. Are you bitter about that? I don't think I was the right guy. You know, initially when the job was first uh, positioned out there, it was really to be kind of an executive chairman for the uh, a CEO founder. The job changed significantly in the time that I was thinking about it. But I do think there's an intersection between the digital world and the industrial world, that there's going to be more industrial people that play in the digital You know, look, the Uber platform is amazing. How many, how their many people problems, here use Uber? Their, their problems are not, uh, are not so almost their, their problems are not technical. Their problems are going to be regulatory. It's going to be, uh, do, the tech, do the drivers unionize someday? Their problems, the, the things that will limit Uber's growth will be industrial world type challenges, not digital world type challenges. It sounds like so I think there's more people that can play in that direction uh, today than ever before. It sounds like you're happy you didn't get it. Look, I, to, at the end of the day, I wasn't really ready for something that visible, you know, that intense at that moment in time. But a year or two from now, those are the kinds of companies I want to be around. Um, Uber, would you say you're a long-term bull, bear, skeptic? Look, one of the things you're going to find if you go into business is there's, there's always a difference between a good idea and a bad idea, and between a good idea and an idea that makes money. I think Uber's an amazing idea, not just a good idea. It's a seminal idea. You know, the question is, is it going to be Google? You know, search was a great idea. It's also a wildly profitable idea, right? I think that's what still has to be determined in Uber is that can you take this thing that's an amazing idea and turn it into a fantastic business, profitable business. And that remains to be seen. Will you be a CEO again? Look, my desire, I want to work with growth companies. I want to, I want to really help entrepreneurs. Uh, the space I like the best, Mike, is healthcare, and you know what I'd like to do is go back and maybe uh, work with some people and start a healthcare company someday. So that's a yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how soon can you imagine starting a healthcare company? Mm, gosh, I mean, I, I really I, I need to kind of take a little bit of time first and think it through. I think one of the things that I've but, thought like about months or years. Or? Uh, months, months or. A short amount of years, really. I've, got, I, I've always wanted to have a second life. Uh, a couple of uh, things to note there. Uh, when it came to the jet, so it was a terrible practice. We shouldn't have done it. Stopped uh, when I found out about it. I thought the question when he answered, I, I wasn't quite clear how it is that he missed that for so long they had a, a second jet going. I think Mike Allen asked it in the right way. You never noticed the extra jet out there? <laughs> and, and it wasn't quite clear yeah, what, the, what answer the answer was. was. He said he was working too hard. Right, he's focused on, on, the, on the business. Focused on the job and didn't really talk to the corporate aviation people. As for his the performance of the company under him, when Mike Allen asked him, you know, did you know what was going on? But, and he basically said, if you remember at the beginning, and Mike Allen struggled because he didn't quite understand the word, hard to outrun our end use markets, which is a lot of vernacular to say that their two biggest divisions, power, um, it, we're struggling, and power right. and oil what and gas. Could they do if what could they do? It right. wasn't his fault. It was, it was just what, what was going on in the industry. Um, and Uber, did he make news when he said that when they were talking about him being the CEO, it actually wasn't about being the CEO, it was about being executive chairman while Travis was still there to help the I think founder. He said that's how the discussions began, began. and then it, mm -hmm. it morphed into something that would make him more of an operating right. executive. As, as the, the right changes guy. happened at Uber as during the, the process, Uber, right? We saw Uber. that whole thing evolve. But um, deflecting any kind of... Not really taking responsibility, I think, for what happened under his watch by saying, well, it's what happened in the two biggest industries that you know, we or, do. Or commentary about the stock's massive decline right. since he's left, um, only saying that he has full confidence in G in the future. And, and in the new team there, uh, maybe Mike will get back to the stock question uh, later on in the conversation. If he does, and it's newsworthy, we'll bring it to you. High stakes on the Hill, folks. The House.